You do everything you can in the natural means, but you have to let it enter into your mind. There is a spirit realm that you can't see. And there are, is demons uh, working against you because you are a child of God. Can believers be oppressed by a demon? Yes. Can they be influenced by a demon? Yes. Can they be possessed by the devil? No. A Christian who has the <clears throat> Holy Spirit in them cannot be possessed of the devil. You can't have two kingdoms in you. You either have the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Satan. I'm so glad I have the kingdom of God in me and the Holy Spirit. If you would like weekly content that builds your faith and helps you walk out all that God has for your life, subscribe and be a part of Life Family. Living for Jesus while living in Babylon. I have tried to cover some uh, pretty tough topics. Um, abortion, uh, sexuality. Uh, today, I, I hope you find it interesting. I'm going to probably go to the sh more shallow end of the pool coming up on the subjects like critical race theory, mental health, immigration, midterms, and the rapture of the church. Some lighter lifting in the coming weeks. I, I want to just lead you in this as we jump into this topic because, um, uh, you know, uh, we don't have to uh, agree to belong and so I want you to read this with me. Uh, all the campuses, would you read this out loud? And this one? Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know about that second one. I don't know how that got in there. 531 mass shootings this year. How they define mass shooting is more than two or three. Uh, the frequency of it is stunning, and the evil of it uh, is uh, heartbreaking. It's, it's happening in our country. Our country. Uh, is this mental illness or something else? It seems like uh, we take all uh, human depravity and just dump it into one big bucket called mental health. That's the best Babylon can do with defining what's happening in our nation. Uh, Stockton, California, serial killer kills six just walking up and down the street hunting people. Uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, just this week, 15-year-old boy kills five people in his neighborhood, including a 70-year-old lady that used to babysit him. In Dallas, Texas, a man's convicted of stalking and killing 22 elderly widows who are alone, finds out who they are, goes and robs them. And then the highly anticipated trial in Florida of a 20-year-old who takes a high-powered rifle, walks into his former school, kills 15 students and three faculty. Mental illness or something else? Something else. Demonic activity increasing. 3,000 years ago, there is a, a book of the Bible that was written, shockingly, by a 17-year-old. Wait, what? I know. So all the teenagers here and all the students know how significant you are to God. He's 17-year-old. He has been trafficked, human trafficking, he's trafficked uh, 700 miles from his home. He is removed from uh, Christian environments, Christian culture, Christian schools, Christian family. He is taken there by this nation called Babylon. Babylon overruns Jerusalem at the, at the bequest of the Lord God. He finds himself in a culture he doesn't know how to handle. All of his convictions, everything he's been taught is totally upside down. He's living in a culture that doesn't hold any of his convictions. So what does this young man, Daniel, do? 17 years old. Does he hide? Does he run away? He dives in. He goes to Babylonian school for three years. He serves in the administration of the king who destroyed his country. He befriends Babylonian leaders. 
He gets promotion after promotion after promotion, and he ends up being the second in command of the most powerful nation on the then known earth. He creates a handbook for how to live in a culture that you feel its values is shifting under your feet. He says to us, what you do on Sundays is important, but if that were taken away from you like it was him, the most influence you'll ever have is Monday through Friday in the marketplace. There's a lot of us that feel like uh, Sunday morning, uh, most of you are in the house of the Lord today. Those of you watching online, you've made time for the Lord as he asked you to. And a lot of us feel like this is the most significant day of the week. This is the day that really counts. And what we do Monday through Friday, you know, that's just how we make a living. Oh, that's so upside down. This is where we celebrate what you did in ministry all week long in the marketplace. Marketplace is where real influence happened, and that's what uh, Daniel tells us. It's about a government employee without any religious services to go to who changes the culture. Marketplace spiritual influencers are powerful all throughout Scripture. Abraham was a fig uh, was a farmer amos was a fig harvester luke was a doctor nehemiah was a real estate developer esther was a civil government employee cornelius was a major in the military and rahab she was a working lady <laughs> daniel shows us that it's not just enough to have a relationship with god but having a relationship with Babylon. Those two things are so critically important for how you influence culture. And when you figure those two things out, you will be so highly effective. One of the things Daniel tells us pretty quickly is the difference between forbidden things and offensive things. And if you can figure this out, it will be great as you live in a culture that doesn't hold your convictions. Daniel... Uh, is a Hebrew. He's been taught the Word of God. He knows the law. 17 years old. He's heard his parents teach him. He's gone to church. He's heard his rabbi or his pastor teach him. He's in a culture that has holds none of those. And they offer him food at his job. Here's the food you're going to be given. You're working for the king. Eat the king's food. Problem is, they offer that same food to their idols. And it was written in the law of Moses that Daniel observed a, a Hebrew, a Christian, we'll say for you, cannot eat uh, food that's been offered to idols. He's got a problem. But he understands the difference between forbidden things and offensive things. Uh, food offered to idols is forbidden by God. So what does he do? This is an example of how you work in the marketplace. You understand the difference between forbidden things and offensive things. It offended him, yes, but was it forbidden? Yes. So what does he do? He takes the, his direct report, he takes him aside, and he says to him, listen, as a Hebrew, I love working for you, and I hope I'm doing a good job, but I can't eat this food. Watch how he does this, Daniel 1, 8 through 9. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Watch this. He asked. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile him, himself in this way. And God was already working. God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Do you see that? He didn't cause a fuss. He didn't disrupt business. He didn't make a scene. He pulled his direct report aside. He asked permission. He explained the situation. And the, the Lord moved on his direct report's heart. And uh, granted him, yes, you don't have to eat the kingdom. He even had a solution. Listen, I've already figured this out. We're not going to disrupt business here. I've already got my food set aside. That's how you do it. Knowing the difference between offensive things and forbidden things. Uh, Josh Howerton said, our influence with people will never be greater than our respect for people. You are not going to agree with me on this, and it's just fine. Send me some email. I haven't gotten enough email. <laughs> In the marketplace where you work, where you do business, 
you never compromise your beliefs, but listen to me, not every hill is worth dying on. There are things that offend you, but there are things that are forbidden. A uh, person got in touch with me this past week and said, uh, I work at a huge company here in Austin, Texas, you know, and I'm like, yes, I know that company. And uh, he, uh, he said, uh, they, for coming out day, I didn't know there was one, for coming out day, I guess this past week, uh, they passed out flags, uh, rainbow flags, to everyone in the cubicle. So when I arrived at work, there was a rainbow flag. So in your teaching of Daniel, what do I do? I said, is it a forbidden thing or an offensive thing? He said, it's an offensive thing. I said, we'll fly the flag. Take the flag, take a little Sharpie, and on the back side of the flag, put Genesis 9. Reclaim the flag. Genesis 9, God said, I put my rainbow in the heavens. <clears throat> But he said, it, if, I, if I have the flag, he said, no, 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 no. You're in Babylon. You're in Babylon. You're in a postmodern, post-Christian society. You're in Babylon. What is the best way that you'll have influence in that job, at that job site? Uh, making a big scene, sitting it out. What would Daniel do? Daniel said, is this a forbidden thing or offensive thing? It's a forbidden thing. I can't do it. This flag is an offensive thing to me. The forbidden thing is practicing what it represents. Don't practice it, but put the flag in the pen cup and thank the Lord he created the rainbow. Reclaim the rainbow. Send me some mail. <laughs> Daniel, they changed his name. He said, I don't care. Call me what you want to call me. It offends me that you would call me treasurer a bail. Belshazzar, I'm Daniel. No, you're not. Okay. Not here, you're not. Okay. I'll be whatever you call me. It's not forbidden. It offends me, but it's not forbidden. Call me what you... He goes to three years in school, in Babylonian school. He doesn't sit it out. He goes to school. What do they teach in the Babylonian schools? Babylonian literature, Babylonian culture, and the occult. That's what they taught in Babylonian schools. Now, was it forbidden? Was it offensive? It was offensive. It was forbidden if he practiced it. He didn't practice it. He just learned about it. Babylonian behaviors, Babylonian influence. He absorbed it. He didn't practice it. He understood the difference between offensive and forbidden. Is everybody okay? All right, let's keep moving. One day, Daniel's given this vision. He's in the workplace in Babylon, and he's given this vision, and it's of this great war. And uh, this 17-year-old, uh, as all of us, we wouldn't like, I don't know. I think this is from the Lord. I have no idea what it means. And he says to the Lord, Lord, send me. I pray to you, God, send me the answer to this vision I've had. I don't understand what I'm supposed to do with it. God hears his prayer, God answers his prayer, and sends an angel. An angel is a messenger that takes your prayers from God to you. Uh, Daniel 10, 12 through 13, the spirit of Babylon, how to, how to live in Babylon in the workplace. Do not be afraid, Daniel. This is the angel talking. Since the first day you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were... Does God hear my prayer? The moment, the second you pray it, he hears it. Your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. All right, let's look at the next part. But the prince of Persia, the prince of the Persian kingdom, prince of Persia, resisted me how long? The prince of Persia held your answer up 21 days. How long have you been waiting for the answer that you prayed? Then Michael, who is the archangel, one of the chief princesses, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. So the second you pray it, God hears it and sends the angel, the, the answer via an angel. Or you see it manifested in yes, no, or wait here on earth. But there is this prince 
of the Persian kingdom or prince of Persia, as it said in the King James Version, the prince of Persia, who, uh, who contested me, who delayed me 21 days. This angel said, I had your answer, but I had to fight the prince of Persia for 21 days. All right, so you pray, God answers, and then there is this battle over the prayer you prayed. And it is real. You can't see it. It's in the unseen world, but it is real. And we see it right here through the eyes of Daniel about the Babylonian spirit that you're encountering in this culture and in the workplace and at school. Satan is not the opposite of God. Sometimes we say, well, who would be the opposite of God? We would say Satan. Well, he is in values and he is in uh, his mission statement, but he is not omniscient, he is not omnipresent, and he is not omnipotent. He is a created being, Genesis 131, Ezekiel 28. He is a created being. He was created as Lucifer, uh, second in command in heaven, until pride corrupted his heart and he was cast down. When he was cast down, he took one third of the angels with him. But he is not all knowing, he is not all powerful, and he can't be everywhere at once as God can. So there is this prince of Persia. Since he can't be everywhere at once, he creates a stronghold or a high pressure system. We understand that in Texas. When there's a weather, a high pressure system, we don't have any what? Rain. It, it just kind of, the weather people say, just, it's just sitting on top of us like a dome. That is what Satan does in regions. He can't be everywhere at once, so he creates a force. There is a prince of Persia. There is a prince of Austin. There's a prince of Highland Lakes. There's a prince of Dripping Springs. There's a prince of downtown Austin. There is a prince of central Austin. There is a prince of Leander Cedar Park. Every city has a, a, a high-pressure system, a, uh, a dome over it of a prince, a prince, a satanic spirit that tries to delay God's answer for you and tries to kill, steal, and destroy. Since he can't be everywhere at once, he creates this. Daniel encountered him as the prince of Persia, demons, they are fallen angels. They once served the Lord. Satan seduced them. Lucifer, who becomes Satan, seduces one third of the angels, Revelation 12 and 4. God casts them out of heaven down to the earth. Demons are emotional. They can cry out. They can plead. They can laugh. They have intelligence. They, they have uh, they have, uh, they're intellectual. They can reason. They have logic. They can speak. They can communicate. They're strategic. They have schemes, plans, playbooks. Run this play for that. Run this play for that. We've been doing this thousands of years. They'll bite on that for sure. Uh, demons are called tempters. They, uh, John 8, the father of lies, they tempt you. They deceive you. All of that is what demons do. Also, demons know that their demise is coming. They know that they don't have a short time. So the Bible says that when it begins to dawn on them that the day of their demise is coming, there is an increase of mayhem on the earth and evil. It's what we're seeing right before our eyes. In, uh, in Matthew 8 and 29, there was two men possessed by a devil. They were good men. Somehow they allowed something to happen to them that uh, of their own willful nature. Uh, Satan cannot, nor a demon cannot come in to you without an opening. You have to open yourself to a spirit. And they did. The Bible is silent of what it was, so we'll stay silent on it. But when Jesus encounters those two men possessed by the demon, uh, he, he begins to talk to them. Isn't that something? Jesus begins to address the demons. It's just like normal business. And um, 
the, the, the demon says to the Lord inside the man, speaks through the man and says, why are you, Jesus, why are you tormenting us before our time? So they know their time is coming. And so they've got to work hard. The Bible tells us clearly that because the days are shortened, the satanic influence is increasing with frequency and with power. Here's some good news. You ready for some good news? Colossians 2.15. Jesus, having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them by triumphing over them by the cross. And how do we know he... How do we know that he made a public spectacle of them when he rose from the dead? Hallelujah. He is alive forevermore. He did not destroy them. He just defeated them. And he gives you the power to defeat them as well. There are 80 references in the New Testament of Jesus uh, talking to people with a demon or an unclean spirit. 80 references. It's just how he did things. Uh, you and I, as believers living in Babylon, postmodern, post Christian society, uh, can expect to be buffeted and oppressed by demon activity. They have high pressure systems over us. Some of you are wondering why, why do I feel such a. Uh, um, where are the thought, thoughts coming from? Why am I so oppressed? Why are my wife and I fighting like we have never fought before? Why is there so dis, much disruption in my workplace? Why is my business taking on water when I'm doing all the right things? You've asked all those whys. You do everything you can in the natural means, but you have to let it enter into your mind. There is a spirit realm that you can't see. And there are, is demons working against you because you are a child of God. Can believers be oppressed by a demon? Yes. Can they be influenced by a demon? Yes. Can they be possessed by the devil? No. A Christian who has the <clears throat> Holy Spirit in them cannot be possessed of the devil. You can't have two kingdoms in you. You either have the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Satan. I'm so glad I have the kingdom of God in me and the Holy Spirit power of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 12 says to you, all believers living in Babylon, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. He calls it a dark world. And against, watch this, the spiritual forces of evil. And where are they? Where are they? Many people think, well, Satan, the devil, you know, we've folklore literature, he's in hell. No, no, no. Satan is in the heavens. He's in the second heaven and his high pressure system of evil and his uh, territorial domain is in the heavenly realms. Uh, I, I grew up church all my life and old timers back when I uh, grew up, they had this phrase, I don't hear it anymore, but it, like we need to pray through. Anybody ever heard that? We need to pray through. Pray through what? I, would, I always kept thinking like through what? Through a wall? Through what? This. Through. We have to pray through. Pray through. Pray through because there's a high pressure system inhibiting your prayer, keeping the angel from coming back to you. That's our struggle. There's a difference between a foothold and a stronghold. A demon uh, uh, wants to just get a foothold. Ephesians 4, 27, do not give the devil a what? Foothold. 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, for the weapons of our warfare, I'm going to give you those in just a moment, are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of? So there's a difference in a foothold and a stronghold. A foothold happens when you allow yourself to be opened by different things, um, you can be influenced, and then as you repeat that behavior, you give an opening. It's a foothold. It's a, a thought that you begin to marinate on, and uh, it becomes an action. 
And when it becomes an action, what you've been thinking about becomes a stronghold. Stronghold is a place in you, in your mind, actually, in your emotional, logical. Uh, it's a stronghold that the enemy sets up and he's like, all right, I'm here. And it's this thing. And I hear it all the time. I got a pastor a long time. How come I keep falling too? How, came I, how come I keep repeating that? Why? It, there is a stronghold. Let me give you three weapons, three weapons, three weapons. Well, before I do that, let me just do this. Uh, uh, at my, uh, I mowed the yard for my, at my dad's house. Uh, you just mow the yard all the time in hot Texas. One time there was this weed and I just, uh, I, I used to try to weed the, the gardens, the flower beds. Yeah, and I just like, I just let that grow. That ain't no biggie. And it grew. And the next year it grew. And the next year it grew. And I was like, oh, well, it's a weed. No big deal. I, I went uh, back to my dad's house uh, this week. And this is what that weed is. <laughs> this is the difference between a foothold and a stronghold. Foothold just starts out real small, itty bitty. Uh, something you think about, something you just have in you. And if you don't pull it out in the name of Jesus, it becomes a stronghold. And you, how are you going to get that thing down? It's going to take a lot of work, but you can do it. And here are three ways. Weapons of our warfare are mighty to God through the pulling down of strongholds. First of all, the name of Jesus. Everybody shout Jesus. Downtown shout Jesus. Jesus. When you say the name of Jesus, whew, demons start trembling. Philippians 2 9, God has exalted Jesus and given him a name above every name. If you can name it, his name is above it. Cancer, his name is above it. Depression, his name is above it. Oppression, his name is above it. Suicidal tendencies, his name is above it. If you can name it, there is a name greater than anything. The name of Jesus. I wish I had somebody shout the name of Jesus. <clears throat> if Sunday is the only time you're saying the name of Jesus, you are allowing a wonderful opportunity. When you go into your work cubicle like Daniel, just start saying the name of Jesus. Oh, you don't have to say it out loud. You just say, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Parents, you need to walk your children's bedrooms. You got a teenager? Do a lot of walking. In the name of Jesus. Go out and put your hand on your teenager's car or your single adult or married children's car, whatever. Just put your hand on the car and say, in the name of Jesus. When you say the name of Jesus, there becomes a shift of authority. Secondly, the blood of Jesus, Exodus 12, 13. When the Israelites understood there's a death angel coming to visit you, uh, you better put the blood over your doorpost. That was type and shadow of what Jesus would do for us on Calvary, shed his blood for you. He said, if you'll put the blood of the lamb, Exodus 12 and 13, over the doorpost of your home, then when the death angel come, it will pass over. That's why we call it Passover. It will pass over you, and that's exactly what happened. Anybody who didn't have the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, the death angel came to them, that destructive demon, and took something precious from them. Get uh, used to saying, I... Plead. That's what the old timer said. I plead the blood. Well, I don't even know what that means. I plead the blood. Or I place the blood of Jesus over my home. Dads, moms, go out to the front, your front house. Don't do this when the neighbors are watching. They'll, they'll have you taken away. But just go out there, put your hand on your house and say, in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, protect this house and everybody in it. Uh, Managers, CEOs, CFOs, 
place the blood of Jesus over your workplace. I place the blood of Jesus over this workplace. When the enemy sees the blood, he'll have to pass over. And third is the word of God. Hebrews 4 and 12 tells us the word of God is living and active, is sharp. It's a two-edged sword piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit. Three great weapons that pull down strongholds. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the word of God. If you will begin to commit to memory one verse a month, Wait, one verse a month? Yeah, just, just try that. Well, I can do one a week. Yeah, but how many have you done already? <laughs> Let's just go for one a month. That'll give you 12. That's 12 bullets to fire when the enemy comes running in at you. All right? Hallelujah. When Jesus Christ was led from baptism to the wilderness, he was weak from fasting he was dehydrated. He was suffering out in the desert. The enemy came to him at his weakest point and began to tempt him. And what did Jesus do? Jesus, the Son of God, used the word. It is written. And he quotes the scripture. And the devil says, oh, we're all good. He has to back off. If you will commit... Google up uh, scriptures that talk about how to overcome or the power of Jesus Christ. Google up scriptures, the power, scriptures about the power of Jesus Christ. It'll give you a whole bunch. Commit one of those to memory a month. You'll have 12 bullets to fire when the enemy comes. When the enemy comes into your life, here's what the Word of God says. Quote it. That old slew foot, he'll have to back up. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the word of God. Say it with me. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God. Say it. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the word of God. We're going to push back the territory and tear down every stronghold. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. And we hope and pray that this message touched your heart. And we want to hear from you. We want to get to know you. There are several links below this video that you can connect and let us know what's going on in your life. So we would love to invite you to do that. But most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, that is amazing and we want to celebrate you. I invite you to text next steps to 22999. We'll respond with a text and give you some resources and next steps for your faith journey. So we just celebrate you and want to uh, invite you to do that. Thank you so much for making this decision to follow Jesus. It's amazing. So thank you again for being a part of our service today. We will see you next time. If you don't have a home church, we would love to invite you to be part of Life Family. Remember, you belong here. Join us again next Sunday or any time throughout the week. Hit that bell so you never miss when we post a new video. Hope to see you again soon.